Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and call us, 208-991-4783. Well, today we begin a new series, A Life in Your Hands. Much like uh, Call the Police, A Life in Your Hands was a summer replacement show. Uh, and it was even more popular and in demand than uh, Call the Police. Call the Police was a summer replacement for three seasons. A Life in Your Hands was actually a summer replacement in four different seasons uh, for NBC. 1949, 50, 51, and 52. As a consequence, there were different actors who played the lead role. The first is Ned Lefevre, and there's really not a whole lot known about him. Uh, so you'll uh, forgive the lack of uh, information, there's just no information I can find to offer. The series itself is pretty fascinating. Uh, the concept, and I can't help but thinking Earl Stanley Gardner, who also did the... Uh, Christopher London series we played a, a year or so back, did have some uh, say on the whole concept. The concept was that a lawyer representing neither prosecution or defense, acting as a friend of the court, seeking only the truth, could bring justice. And uh, I think it's fairly well executed. We're going to play the first episode we have in just a second. Before we do get started, I do want to let you know that my novel, Tales of the Dim Night, is now available as an audiobook. You can buy it on Audible or through Amazon.com, and probably by the time this thing is uploaded, uh, you should also be able to uh, purchase it through iTunes. It's a wonderful superhero comedy. I know a lot of folks have said that... Uh, uh, they they don't have time to uh, read, so it works for those who would prefer an audiobook version. So you can download that uh, today. And also, if you have the Kindle, be sure and pick up What Made the Golden Age Shine. Now it's time for today's episode of A Life in Your Hands. This one is called, from June 7th, 1949, The Final Curtain Call. Raleigh Cigarettes present Earl Stanley Gardner's a life in your hands. Did you hear him threaten her? What was the position of the body? Was she still alive at 8.30? Listen while we place a life in your hands. You never know when you step from the safety of your home, when you may witness a violent death and be called upon to testify as to what you saw and heard, and suddenly find yourself with a life in your hands. Murder is a dark enigma that strikes fear into the heart of man. Strange, baffling, mysterious. But the darkest crime one man can invent, another man can unravel. And such a man is Jonathan Kegg, created by Earl Stanley Gardner, the world's most popular writer of mysteries. Mr. Gardner is also creator of the famous Perry Mason, Doug Selby, and dozens of equally outstanding fictional characters. Jonathan Kegg is a lawyer, but of a very special sort. When he appears in court, Jonathan Kegg acts only in the capacity of amicus curiae. And here is Mr. Kegg himself to tell you what that is. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Kegg, just what is meant by amicus curiae? Translated from the Latin, amicus curiae simply means friend of the court. It refers to a lawyer or an expert who enters a case neither on behalf of the prosecution nor the defense. He acts impartially, seeking only the truth. 
how does an amicus curiae go about finding the truth? It is my belief that by cross-examination of witnesses, the truth can usually be learned. And as amicus curiae, you conduct such cross-examination in the hope of seeing justice done? Exactly. All we need is testimony from witnesses who remember what they hear. The basis of our system of justice is the ability of witnesses to relate accurately what they saw or heard. You never know when a crime is going to be committed. Even now, somewhere in the city, there may be a crime in the making. Electrician? I, uh, I'm here, Miss Molly. Ah. But I guess there's nobody else in the theater. It's only about four in the afternoon. Anything I can do for you? Well, then who might you be? Uh, no. Well, you might be all sorts of people. <laughs> you might even be another bartender. I'm Tom Kalish, Miss Molly, the new assistant stage manager. I just started today. Fine, fine, fine. A career in the theater. <laughs> I, I, Victoria Molly, have a career in the theater. You know that, did you? Well, of course, Miss Marley. I, I Vicky Marley, am an actress. Worse, I'm married to an actor. The highly paid, thoroughly successful, extremely talented Mr. Peter Bond is my husband and the star of the show. Very good for Peter. Peter is starred. Victoria's featured. Uh, do you know, uh, are, are you aware, Mr. Uh, 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 Kalish? Mr. Kalish, are you aware of the subtle distinction between a star and a feature player? Huh? Are you? Well, uh, uh, yes, Miss Marley, but in this case... All I... right, all right. I, I'm embarrassing you. But it's something you'll just have to get used to. Three, four days a week I come in like this. It's part of the plot. The lady drinks. <laughs> but I have a way. I get around it. I come here to the theater early and nap. I nap it off, and by curtain time, I'm as good as new. Very simple, don't you think? Miss Marley, I figure what other people do is their own business. And, and you know something else? I've never missed a show, or an entrance, or even a cue. Never. Got an understudy. Pretty little tramp, Lucy Devereaux. Peter, my Peter, Mr. Barnes, he thinks very highly of her. As an actress, I tell myself. Yeah. But Lucy, my understudy, she's never had to go on for me, but never. Now, isn't that a shame? For Peter, isn't it? Miss Marley, I'm brand new with the show. I, I... Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I know. This is just talk, that's all. You know whether Charlie finished with painting the second act job? He said he'd have it done in time for the show tonight. Uh, the head stage manager, you mean? Yeah, uh, Charlie wanted me to speak to you about well, that. Don't tell me you forgot it again. Well, he... Oh, I told him at least a dozen. Have you seen the drop? I walk on, a blonde. The drop is about three shades lighter than my hair. It makes me look terrible. It's like a golden ball behind me. That's what Charlie wanted me to tell you. He didn't forget, Miss Marley. Mr. Barnes told him not to repaint it, and the producer, Mr. Walters, okayed that. But they what? Well, Charlie said he was all set to go ahead when Mr. Barnes called him. Well, we'll just say about this thing once and for all. Ball, you got any change, Nicholas? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Mm hmm. Here. Oh, thanks. Oh, here, keep it out. Oh, no, no, just for a couple of nickels. That's crazy, Miss Marley. I'll keep it. Hello, what's this about not repainting the second act drop? Don't now, Victoria, me. Why isn't it being repainted? You just try that. You just... Try putting me out of this show, you two big Casanova. I'll blow you and that cheap little Frank's reputation to pieces. No, no, I won't be reasonable about anything of the kind. You're trying to make a big flash with her. Don't lie about it. Forget it, baby. Just plain forget it. Before that girl takes over my part, I'll go to my grave. <laughs> And 
And now back to the theater. The echoing emptiness of the stage is now electric with the tension that comes just before curtain time. Three minutes. Three minutes. Curtain in three minutes. Uh, Mr. Barnes, three minutes. Uh, Mr. Barnes? That's funny. He's not... If you're looking for Mr. Barnes, he's in his wife's dressing room down the hall. Oh, thanks, Miss Devereaux. He's on in three minutes. You'd better go and remind him, then. Yeah, I guess I had. And don't let the sound and fury bother you. It's just Victoria giving him his nightly lecture. Okay. Three minutes. Curtain in three minutes. First act curtain going up in three minutes. Don't give it to me. I can act things around Devereaux. Drunk all the shows are the last time when you lower your voice. No, no, I won't lower my voice. I'll talk as loud as Nicky, I can. I swear if you don't shut up. Three minutes, Mr. Barnes. You're on in three minutes. All right, Kalish. Thanks. I'll be down in just a minute. <laughs> They go for him, don't they, the audience? They ought to. He's wonderful. You've been with the show long, Miss Devereaux? Since it opened last November. Uh Uh-huh. For all the acting experience has given me, I might just as well have stayed in Des Moines. Yeah, I know. Miss Marley was telling me she's never missed a performance. Sort of tough in a way, huh? Mm, I don't mind too much, but I can't see why Peter puts up with it. She's terrible. Hello, Lucy. Oh, Mr. Walters. Hi. Where did you come from? Can the producer watch his own show? (laughs) Ah, Lucy, you're beautiful. I love it. <laughs> I've been out front. How are things going back here, Kelly? Just fine, Mr. Walters. Like the show? I think it's great. And Peter Barnes, our star of stars? Hey, he's got the stuff all right. Yes, he has. I say, how's the house? Not bad for a Monday. The mezzanine's full up. Fine, fine. Uh, Kayla, you'd better give Miss Marley a call. She's on shortly. All right, Mr. Wallace. Oh, Si, give me a break. Um, maybe she's asleep. I'm all ready to go on, please. Just this one. Now, darling, be reasonable. I can't do that. Please, Si. Oh, now you know it's out of the question. Come on, be sweet, darling. You'll get there on your own, Lucy. Don't bother with tricks. <laughs> okay. I'll be sweet. You want me to call it? Now, that's very sweet. Yes. You'd better appreciate me. I do. Very much. (laughs) She's a cute kid. One of the cutest. One of the very cutest kids. That's Miss Deverell. The name of heaven. Sorry, sorry. Good Lord, come and see. She's in there sitting in a chair. Who, Lucy? Miss Marley. Somebody stabbed her. Miss Marley? There's a knife in her throat. Oh, sorry. She's dead. She's dead. Uh, Mr. Keg, I should begin this discussion by telling you that I am absolutely certain Peter Barnes did not kill his wife. Very interesting, Mr. Walters. As you know, they've brought an indictment against him, and the trial has been underway for a couple of days now. The prosecution is making a good case against him, but the charge is absolutely baseless. Uh, Just what exactly do you want me to do, Mr. Walters? I believe Vicki Marley committed suicide. But the police and the DA seem to have overlooked or at least discredited the possibility completely. Did you suggest this theory to them? Yes, and, well, they were very polite about it, but... Mr. Keg, I would like you to volunteer your services to the court as amicus curiae. And by examining all the evidence, I believe you can prove it was almost a physical impossibility for Peter Barnes to kill his wife. Have you evidence to support that? Yes. Peter is on stage during most of the show, especially the first and second act. Vicky's body was discovered during the second act, while Peter was in plain sight of the audience. Have you considered that he might have killed her between the first and second act? No. According to her maid, she was still alive when the second act curtain went up. Have you considered that someone else may have killed her? Miss Devereaux, perhaps? Yes. Yes, I have, but... Well, it doesn't add up. Lucy could have killed Victoria, but I can't think why. She had replaced Victoria, at least as an actress, in Peter's estimation, as well as my own. I'll admit it presents a fascinating challenge, Mr. Walters. And you may name your own fee, Mr. King. No, no, Mr. Walters. The Nicus Curiae will never accept a fee. I am particularly fortunate in that I'm financially secure. 
Therefore, I'm able to serve in that capacity and to indulge my passion for helping to see justice done. Then you will do so in this case? Remember, if I do offer my services to the court as amicus curiae tomorrow morning, my object will not be to prove that Peter Barnes didn't kill his wife. I shall seek only to uncover the facts and fit them together in a logical pattern, no matter whom it may help or hurt. Your Honor, it is my belief that the testimony, as so far presented, does not form a true picture of the facts. I respectfully request the court's permission to serve as amicus curiae and in that capacity to cross-examine some of the witnesses. Very well, Mr. Keg. Permission is granted. Mr. Barnes, you say the last time you saw your wife alive was when you left your dressing room a minute or so before the first act began. That's right. It has been conclusively established that Miss Marley was still alive when the second act curtain went up. Would you mind telling me, Mr. Barnes, just how long you were on the stage during the second act prior to that point at which Miss Marley makes her entrance? I go off just once. I'm supposed to make an exit onto a veranda. And then I reappear a few minutes later through a French door in the back wall of the stage. How much time would you say elapses during that period? As I say, a few minutes. I've never given it much thought. I see. This letter opener with which your wife was stabbed... Do you recognize it? Yes. It's mine. When was the last time you saw it? I don't really remember. A few days ago in my dressing room, I think. In your dressing room? I think so. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. That'll be all. (laughs) Your Honor, I believe there are additional facts which have not been brought to light in the testimony so far. I understand that the entire cast and the people sitting in the front row of the audience have been subpoenaed and are here in court. I would like to talk with one of those people. We will call to the stand any person you desire, Mr. Keg, and that person must testify. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, few of us ever consider that we might at any moment be witness to a crime. The crimes of violence and passion that you read about in your newspapers are not committed in a vacuum. Much of the evidence which could solve them is frequently witnessed by many people. If you should be the one called upon to testify, as our next witness is about to do, you would surely have a life in your hands. We return now to the courtroom where the well-known stage star, Peter Barnes, is on trial for the murder of his wife, Victoria Molly. Jonathan Kegg, serving as amicus curiae, a friend of the court, is about to call his next witness from those members of the cast and theater audience who have been subpoenaed as witnesses. If you were this witness, you would have a life in your hands. I would like to have Tom Kalish, the assistant stage manager, take the stand. Tom Kalish appeared before you entered the case, Mr. Keg. He's already been sworn. Come forward, Tom Kalish. Mr. Kalish, the court record shows that when you testified before, you told briefly about a quarrel you overheard between Mr. Barnes and Miss Marley. What were they quarreling about? Well... First, I heard Miss Marley yelling, don't give me that. I can act rings around Devereaux, drunk or sober. And then Mr. Barnes said something about lowering her voice. She said she wouldn't lower her voice. And then he said, I swear, if you don't shut up. And by then, I was knocking on the door to give him his call. I didn't hear the end of what he said. Did Mr. Barnes come to the door? Yes, he did. And he said he'd be right down. You saw him? Yes. Now, Mr. Kalish, I want you to consider this next question very carefully before answering it. How long was Mr. Barnes off the stage during the second act? I'd say at least four minutes. That's a very accurate estimate. Actually, Mr. Barnes, or rather the person who is now playing his part, is off the stage for four minutes and 35 seconds. I clocked it at last night's performance. (laughs) Mr. Kalish, Miss Devereaux has testified that she was the first to discover Miss Marley's body. 
In your own words, will you please tell the court exactly what you remember is taking place just before that discovery? Well, <clears throat> Miss Devereaux and I were watching the show from the wings when Mr. Wallace came in. From where? From out front. And he asked how things were going backstage and did I like the show. Uh, Mr. Kalish, will you try to tell the court as nearly as you can the conversation that you and Miss Devereaux and Mr. Walters had at that time? Well, I'll try, Mr. Kalish. Please do. Mr. Barnes' fate may depend on how well you remember it. Well, let's see. Uh, Miss Devereaux and I both said hello to Mr. Walters. And he said, sort of kidding, Lucy, you're beautiful. And then he said to me, I've been out front. How are things going back here? And I answered that it was going all right. Yes. Yeah. Go on. Uh, and then Mr. Walters asked, how's the house? And Miss Devereaux and I both jumped in to answer that it was pretty full for Monday. And then Mr. Wallers asked me to give Miss Marley a call because she was on pretty soon. And Miss Devereaux said, oh, give me a break, Si. Maybe she's sleeping. I'm all ready to go on. But Mr. Wallers wouldn't go for that. How do you mean, Mr. Kalish? Well, he talked her out of it. Something about Miss Devereaux getting there on her own and not having to bother with tricks. So Miss Devereaux offered to call Miss Marley herself. And then a few seconds after she's gone, we heard her scream and... She came running back crying and told us Miss Marley was dead. I see. Earlier in your testimony, Mr. Kalish, you stated that Miss Marley made a phone call in your presence. Will you tell us about that? Well, that afternoon when she came to the theater, she'd had a few drinks, like I said, and was kind of talkative. And after we'd got acquainted, she asked me if Charlie, he's a head stage manager, if he'd had a certain piece of scenery repainted that she wanted done. When I told her that Mr. Barnes had told Charlie not to repaint it, she blew up and called him on the telephone. She called Mr. Barnes? I... Yeah, yeah, I think it was him. Did she address him by name? No, but she bawled him out something awful. Did you, uh, did you hear her place the call? Yeah, I heard her dial a number. Do you know what number she dialed? No, sir, I had no way of knowing. I understand. Now, is this phone she used a pay phone? Yes, it is. And she didn't have any change she borrowed from me. I see. She had to borrow a nickel from you to make the call. Yeah, except it was two nickels she borrowed. Two nickels? Did she make a second phone call at this time? Uh, no, sir. She used both nickels on the same call. You mean that before she dialed the number, she dropped two nickels into the payphone? Yes, sir. I figured it was because she wasn't quite herself, you know. I see. Hmm. Can you remember what she said when the party at the other end of the line answered? Well, like I say, she was sore as a boil, but she said, Hello, what's this about not repainting the second act drop? All at once in a big rush, and she said something about his being a two-bit Casanova and trying to put her out of the show. Oh, yeah, and she wound up by saying, before that girl takes over my part, I'll go to my grave. Then she hung up and walked down to her dressing room. I want you to think carefully, Mr. Kalish. At any time during Miss Marley's phone conversation, did she ever explicitly address the person to whom she was talking as Peter or Mr. Barnes? No. No, she didn't. Thank you very much, Mr. Kalish. That'll be all. Your Honor, I would like to recall Mr. Cyrus Walters to the stand. Very well, Mr. Keg. Mr. Walters will take the stand. <coughs> Mr. Walters, would you mind telling the court why you asked me to intercede in this case? I ask you to offer your services to the court because, in my opinion, Miss Marley had not been murdered. I thought she committed suicide. You thought she did? Don't you still think so? I I honestly don't know. When you originally appealed to me to appear in court as amicus curiae, you stated that apart from your personal conviction of Peter Barnes' innocence, there was factual proof of it. Would you mind telling the court of what you felt that proof consisted? Not at all, Mr. King. I told you that I regarded Peter's murdering Vicky as physically impossible. She was alive when the second act curtain went up. I thought Peter was on stage for all but a few moments of the second act and I couldn't see how he could possibly have committed the crime. But uh, now, in view of what evidence you've uncovered, I, I'm i not so sure. I am, Mr. Walters. I'm absolutely certain that Peter Barnes did not murder his wife. Order. Order in the court, or I'll clear it at once. Mr. Walters, this is one little drama you bungled very Badly. I, I don't know what you're talking about. It's now a matter of court record that you, by your own testimony, requested me to determine whether or not Peter Barnes had sufficient time to murder his wife. 
but because you must have known through your long association with the show that he did have sufficient time to commit the crime, I can only assume that your intention was to ensure that point being brought out strongly in the court, thus strengthen the case against him. But that wasn't all you were asking. Now, listen here. You You felt sure that Mr. Kalish, being new to the cast, would place great emphasis on the quarrel which took place immediately before the first curtain. Well, uh, I... But you did not expect him to know about the telephone call Miss Marley made during the afternoon. Because you didn't know he was at the theater early when Victoria Marley arrived. You're crazy. Furthermore... Mr. Kalish remembered quite a few things you said to him and Miss Devereaux. I said nothing of any consequence. Do you disagree with Mr. Kalish's account of the conversation that took place in the wings between you, Miss Devereaux, and himself? Why, I... I... Uh... Don't perjure yourself, Mr. Walters. Remember, Miss Devereaux was there, too. All right. Kalish's account of what was said is, well, substantially true. Really? And will you please tell me, Mr. Walters... Why, after having announced to Miss Devereaux and Mr. Kalish that you had, and I'm quoting you, come in from out front. Why, a few moments later, you asked, how's the house? Meaning the size of the audience. Why, I often ask... If you had been out front, as you stated, you would have certainly known the answer to that question. Was it because while everyone else was watching the second act from backstage, you crossed behind the darkened set... Entered Miss Marley's dressing room and stabbed her to death? Of course not. You're crazy, Kate. I had no motive for killing her. Oh, yes, Mr. Walters. Yes, you did. A twisted, futile motive, perhaps. But motive enough for you. It was Lucy. Shut up! Lucy Devereaux, the one girl you couldn't... Will you shut up? The one girl you didn't want is a hand-me-down from Peter Barnes. And it was the phone call Victoria Marley made to you in the afternoon that first put the idea in your head. It wasn't Peter she called, was it, Mr. Walters? Not with two nickels. His phone number carries a local exchange. So it must have been a toll call to a suburban home, to a house like the one you own in Floral Heights. It was that phone call that decided you. So you conceived an elaborate plan for getting Lucy the role you'd promised her and eliminating Peter in the same stroke by seeing him convicted of his wife's murder. Keg, I... I, I... Did Miss Devereaux know you were in love with her? I... I... <laughs> All right. Yes. Yes, she did. I'd ask her to marry me a number of times, but it was always Peter, Peter. I like you a lot, Cy, and maybe if it weren't for Peter, everything he is, everything he says, every clever mannerism he has, I gave them to him. It drove me crazy that she was so blind to it, that she couldn't see that he was nothing but a puppet. And Victoria Marley, is she another one of your puppets, Mr. Walters? No, no, I... that that was different. I... I didn't want to kill Vicky. But you couldn't think of an easier way. When it would end things so tidily and with all your characters just where you'd planned. So you fell back on an old stage trick. You killed one of them off. But I, I, I didn't as want to. As bloodedly as you'd slip the strings of a marionette, you walked into Victoria Marley's dressing room and murdered her. It, 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 it was all I could think to do. Yes, I guess it must have been, Mr. Walters. But certainly, if you had foreseen how the play would end, I doubt that you would have included that situation. Thank you, Jonathan Keg. May I ask you now to tell us something about next week's show? <laughs> Inasmuch as no man can predict the future, Mr. Wallace, I honestly can't tell you just where we'll find ourselves next week. Whether it be in the criminal court, a coroner's inquest, or judge's chambers, I shall again offer my services as... Amicus Curiae. Friends, here's a cordial invitation for each of you to be with us next Tuesday when you will again hear Jonathan Kegg, created by Earl Stanley Gardner, author of the internationally famous Perry Mason stories and many others. A Life in Your Hands is created by Earl Stanley Gardner with script by John Kelly. The program is produced by Jack Simpson, directed by Homer Heck. Jonathan Kegg is played by Ned LeFever. This is Myron Wallace inviting you to be with us again next week when Raleigh Cigarettes, the pack with the coupon on the back, will again place a life in your hand. <laughs> This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
Welcome back. Well, some moments of melodrama, uh, but I, I, again, I just love the execution and this entire uh, concept of uh, the amicus curiae stepping into the court to uh, defend and represent uh, just uh, justice only. And in some ways, Gardner would work that out in real life through his project, uh, The Court of Last Resort, uh, which there's also a television show about, which we'll play. Uh, and the Court of Last Resort really did just seek to find out the truth, to find out if an injustice had been done, and uh, then to uh, correct it. And uh, it's worth noting this is probably one of the uh, only true uh, courtroom uh, mystery dramas. Uh, there were other lawyers running about. Uh, one, of course, will play will be uh, The Amazing Mr. Malone, a series also known as Murder and Mr. Malone. However, in those cases, while uh, John J. Malone was an attorney, he kind of ran around and acted more like a, a Seamus. And there was a radio series, Public Defender, and another one, defense attorney, and, and they all sort of tended to go the same way in that regards. This one is unique because you had the lawyer actually in the program in the courtroom and then using the information in the courtroom to solve the crime. So I think that definitely makes this series a winner. So we have 13 weeks of it, and I hope you'll enjoy all of it. Well, join us back here tomorrow for Let George Do It, and then next week, another episode of A Life in Your Hands. In the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. And uh, follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.